Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of A Mic on the Podium with me, Michael Seal. Before we start, I want to thank my latest Patreon subscriber, Johan, for his support and all my other Patreon subscribers for their continued support. This podcast would struggle to continue without them, and my Patreon page is quickly becoming a great place to hang out and talk about the world of conducting. There'll be more about my Patreon page later on in this episode. Today, I conduct a conversation with a Colombian conductor, who is at the start of her career, but is already making quite a name for herself. She is conducting fellow at the Philadelphia Orchestra and the Seattle Symphony Orchestra, as well as being the Schulte Conducting Apprentice at the Chicago Symphony under the guidance of Ricardo Muti. It's a great pleasure to welcome Lina Gonzalez Granados. Lena, it's lovely to meet you and to see you. How are you? I am very good. A little bit tired, but all is fine. Just like getting to, uh, used to time zones again, which is always a hassle coming from uh, east to west. Yes. Uh, well, we'll come back to your um, your recent touring, but also guest conducting and flying all here, there and everywhere around the world later on. Right now, I want to go back to the beginning. I know you were born in Cali, Colombia. And I want to know how music first came into your life. Were you, mum and dad were they musical, or were you? Did you grow up in a, you know, in a place where music was everything? How did it first impact your life? Well, my parents are very talented beings, but music is not particularly one of their talents. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> at all. My both of them study medicine. My dad is a doctor. My mom dedicated her life to pursuing other talents but she studied medicine as well and yes uh, Colombia in general is an extraordinary musical country Mm. Uh, not necessarily classical music is the first thing that you it comes up to mind when you think about Colombia but Colombia has first of all the territory is so vast Mm. that the music making it like reflects that so yeah. There's a lot of styles, a lot of uh, fusions, um, and that's how I came to to music in general. It came uh, out of love when I was little. In the school, there was like a big choir, and also when I was very, very little, around five, six years old, uh, there was this choir called the Tuna, which is an Spanish um a Spanish group that does serenades in general. It's like university or college kids that does serenades for their loved ones. Yeah. And we had that in school. So I was the little kid, the only kid in that tuna who was actually in tune. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the five-year-old who was in tune playing castanets and dancing yeah. uh, to the opposite side of the beat all the time. The videos <laughs> are very embarrassing. <laughs> So that's how I it, it came, you know. It came as um, um first, like as a not not a hobby, but um a, a way to have fun. Yeah, and yeah. That, that has stayed for uh, with me. And then, uh, I my my grandfather, who was also a doctor, I remember he used to have a lot of classical LPs. And I remember he had the the first CD he ever had. I mean, this is a long time ago. Was what. It was Symphony Number no. Forty and Beethoven Five. Yes, like one very mixed mixture. And I was maybe six years old, and I remember uh, him putting that on, like putting headphones on me. I I can't forget that uh, feeling ever um, in his in his um, practice. Yeah, he was uh, he was you know attending people, and there was and he had. He was like a painter slash doctor. And I mean, he happened to have like a bust of Beethoven. <laughs> Gigantic. I mean, it's be- it, it was very tacky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I remember hearing that and seeing that and feeling this sense of, you know, seeing that bust and feeling those feelings that when you're five years old, you can't quite grasp what they are. Are you scared? Are you afraid? Are you excited? You know, all of these that they're just feelings that you feel with this music, you know, overwhelmingly beautiful music and deep experience. And 
that is that that was how I started loving classical music. May, that I, I was the the only one in my in my early years, but yeah. in my family who actually lived, I was like a, a a Renaissance woman in the wrong country or a Renaissance infant in the yeah. wrong country. You know, reading. Yes books and listening to classical music at the age of six or seven uh, when people were playing barbies and, uh, <laughs> watching novellas yeah and so w when did you first start learning an instrument other than singing obviously singing is very important for us all but when did you first learn an instrument what was that instrument or have you just stayed a singer and a, and a castanet player ever since <laughs> definitely not <laughs> um, no, I started um, started playing piano. Yeah. Um, professional. Well, I, I want to say professionally. Uh, more more than than a hobby. Maybe when I was ten or eleven, mm. which we, is fairly late. Uh, but I mean, as I told you, my parents have had no clue what to do with me, and. Uh, the the piano was a way for me to to just like get me get me safe you know in a way in a country that I don't know the environment was so unsafe so they figured out that a uh, piano was indoors and yeah they still wanted to you know they didn't want me to go out too much and uh, this is when I was ten or eleven uh, when things got very very rough in, in my city yeah. And uh, yeah, so it started as a hobby. I had a little uh, keyboard that I don't know if I have it here. <laughs> I, I think my mom gave it to me. It's hilarious. And with that, I would put on my headphones again and I would get all the tones of the symphony, you know? Yes. Because, I mean, my fingers were fatter than the, those, you know, those Casio that were. Yes, like, I rem yeah, I remember those. Yeah, we had one as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who, who didn't, you know, with those like little Orient, uh, Oriental tunes and all of these very weird uh, demos. But I remember getting the tunes out all the time. And my mom was like, oh, okay, maybe she has some talent. Then we get it a bigger keyboard, a bigger keyboard, a bigger keyboard. And that's how it started. And then um, when I was maybe 14, I did start it more formally. Yes. Uh, rather late. Yeah. Everybody reminded me how late I was. I didn't start playing the violin until I was nine, uh, and I don't think I started even attempting to play the piano until I was well into my teens, and I still can't play it now. But, you know, I, 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 some people, you know, the last person I interviewed started the piano at three and the cello at six. So, I mean, we all start at different times, you know, that's... Yeah, yeah. We, we are geriatric starters in the music. <laughs> we the are. That when you're, like, above then, so... Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I read that you made your conducting debut at home in Cali, Colombia in 2008, conducting the youth orchestra of the Bellas Artes. Now, how did you get to that point? Why or when did conducting enter your in, into your head as something that you wanted to investigate? And before that debut, had you had any lessons or was you, you just sort of self-taught? Um, it was a combination of a lot of things. Um, the first one, uh, when I decided to commit to, um, to music uh, full time as, you know, as, as a student, um, I realized early on about, you know, my limitations with the piano, even mm. though that's what I wanted to do, you know, and it's extraordinarily anxious inducing and frustrating for someone who has so much music inside and, um, not being able to, to play it you yes. know it, 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 i mean i it could have I, I could have but i always had like these very big dreams for myself like since the beginning you out of naivete maybe i out of not so that was like the first like encounter like psychological encounter is like okay maybe piano is not gonna be the thing that i'm going to do mm. and the biggest the biggest one when i realized that 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 wasn't going to be like my path was like the first red flag was to be so miserable studying it. Yes. You know? yes. <laughs> yeah. Because I felt very lonely. 
Mm. It was it was a very lonely mu uh, experience to make music, you know, in a cubicle for eight hours or mm. where I was for eight hours. Some people have that in them. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. I yeah. admire that deeply. But as much as I love music, I, I hated being alone because it, it has been in my upbringing. Yeah. As I told you, you know, like all my life, it's been like more of like I'm an only child. And like always been a lonely wolf and then first like I entered this beautiful universe of music and then I find people doing music together in orchestras in choirs in chamber music uh, in opera and mm -hmm. I see this and I'm like wow I really need to be in, in into that yes. work of making music with people because I am a very um, a social person yeah. I want to have a conversation all the time. Um, you know, I, I'm i shatty. I talk a lot, <laughs> as you can see. Yeah. Uh, as you can see, and that's that's when conducting entered my life. I remember being in a... See, I, I don't remember if it was Carmina Burana. I always find that there was like a Beethoven 9 that marked my life that mm. I was singing, you know, in the middle of it. And in, I was like in the middle of the big gigantic choir and here I was doing this thing and I felt part of something very important, you know, something with purpose yes. that I never felt with the piano. <laughs> Even though I love the repertoire, I felt it was very, uh, very self-indulgent for me. The, yes. the, my process of, of playing the piano, uh, it wasn't like a shared experience. So that's when I see, I saw I was like, definitely conducting is the, is the path for me. And in Colombia, you get to declare like a major and a minor, something like that. And then I was like, I went to the Dean and I said, well, I'm not gonna be a pianist. So you have to declare a major for me in conducting uh, in undergrad. And they were like, well, this is impossible. We've never done it. And I'm like, well, you need to declare something because I'm not going to graduate. Yeah, <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is how it is. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to graduate and I really want to graduate. And it's the law that I graduate after paying for so long. <laughs> yes. You know? And I think they saw my conviction on it and they made it happen, you know. Mm -hmm. They created orchestration flat classes for me. They created um, all of it, you know, uh, ear train, like a, a more advanced ear training, you know, and it was a whole exper experiment. I was a guinea pig. This is 2008 or something like yeah. that. And even with that, they were like, yes, yes, yes. We're going to, you know, we're going to graduate her, whatever she does. After that, it's our, like, it's not our business. We, we couldn't <laughs> yes. do it. But that that mindset, um, they wouldn't let me conduct too much. You know, it was like a little couple of things where I would conduct with two pianos. But I was like, okay, how am I going to learn how to conduct orchestra if I'm never there, you know? And I wasn't living in Cali. I was living in Bogota. Mm. And uh, I went to, I started looking for places. And I would, you know, there was this guy who went with, um like to a conducting workshop with me. And he has happened to be the, the music director of that conservatory. And I yeah. told him like, hey, give me an opportunity. I just want to conduct Egmont. Give me, a, let, give me one, I, I, I just need one piece. And he was like, yeah, why not? Go conduct. Yeah. And that's how it started, you know, not in school, but like I started looking opportunities elsewhere. And uh, that went on to be like my, my way of living, looking, looking everywhere where I didn't get it, you know? If we if we look ahead, I mean, to say you're qualified as a conductor is an understatement. Um, I'm just going to read off a list of what your qualifications are. Um, and maybe zone in on a couple of these names. You got a master's degree with um, with a graduate diploma in choral, um, master's degree with Charles Peltz, a graduate diploma choral conducting at the New England Conservatory with Erica Washburn, and Doctor of Musical Arts in conducting from Boston University. I mean, you know, to say you're qualified, you're definitely qualified. 
how what did you learn from Charles Peltz and Erica Washburn that you maybe use today? I mean, I would imagine they were one of a couple of your your earliest teachers because uh, we're going to go on. There's plenty of other names coming up soon, you know, mentors and uh, even up to the present day. But you know, just those early steps. What what advice? Uh, what technical things did they give you? Well, with with Maestro Peltz, he really gave me my first technical steps and, yeah. uh, you know, he made me, how do I say it? He's, a, he's also, uh, he's very good at contemporary music mm. and that's where I, I became very clear technically. I mean, yeah. sometimes I'm not that, you know, like most of the time, like clear, clear conducting is where I like win hearts. You know, and, I, I agree uh, completely. But there are times where, where we should be unclear and it helps the situation. Yes, exactly. And sometimes you don't know how, what to do because you're no. just learning, you know, the, the thing. But he uh, he's a great contemporary guy, uh, an amazing opera conductor, and he's a percussionist. And his major in the university was um, wind ensemble conducting. Yeah. So like for for me getting a, like into that repertoire before going into orchestra again yes. because i did orchestra in colombia but then like just focusing on one repertoire that was so specific which 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 is wind ensemble and learning that whole universe of tuning the way that harmonics like you know blend into the, the instruments yes it's, it was a whole thing that i needed that mm. i never had uh, he is an extraordinarily good rehearsal and very um, be very specific. And he is one of the greatest human beings I've ever met. So always very decent, always very good about uh, the way that he treated me and the way that he taught me. Uh, he was always trying to build myself up. Mm. You know, never, you know, even with the the criticism who was uh, who, who which was very uh, direct he always wanted me to see how that i can frame it to always come be become better yes and in a positive her, way yeah yeah and it wasn't like a toxic positivity or oh yes you're good. No, it wasn't a pat in the back it was yeah. always you can do this this is how you do it for example people would say like um your rhythm is not like up to par sometimes when i go to uh, when i used to go to auditions at the beginning but he knew how i mean i dance i do all of these things and he knew colombia mm. so you know, latin america has a different way to to feel the the rhythm so i remember him is like he's like no you don't have problems with rhythm <laughs> what you have is a different way to feel rhythm and if you want to feel it the American way or the European way, which is so different mm. from you, you need to treat it like you are a, an alcoholic with a disease. So you have like, it sounds terrible, but it's not. <laughs> it was like every day you study your starer, you do these exercises, you play with your metronome, you develop like, you know, muscle memory with the metronome and you just like get this monster out of your way. Yeah, your way and yeah. then you can be whatever else you want to be mm. you know like at the moment of your formation you just have to embrace you know that homogeneous way of thinking in order to go to the next step which is to be completely you yes and yeah. he was always that he was always uh, looking uh, looking forward to make me be me in, a, in, in that early stage when you're just like figuring out how to just work, you know? Yes. And, and with that in mind, uh, also something that he never had was professional jealousy. That's why I started with Erica because yeah. he saw uh, that I, I was very good with singers. You know, I had like, I had this uh, early on, uh, I don't know, good, good, good opera instincts or good choral instincts. So he said, 
uh, in the middle of my master's with him. He's like, you need to go study with her and she is going to give you also more opportunities to learn other in- the other instrument, you know, like mm. the choral instrument. Yes. How do you rehearse it and everything? And with her, it was a completely different way. She's like, she's the a strong woman. A, you know, she has tattoos. She's she's just the most badass woman I've ever met. You know, <laughs> and she always was like, okay, Lina, you have to get out of your shell. I know you are like trying to make everyone happy, uh, Charles happy, you know, because yes. you need to, you know, but you just need to be you. You need to own it. You know, stop, stop hiding behind the things that people say that you can't do. Just do yourself, you know, do whatever you want. And we always had these conversations. I don't want to say contentions, but they were always very um, intellectually, uh, you know, butting heads. Yes. Because she wanted that. Yeah. She wanted, you know, she was like, oh, poor baby. You know, sometimes it was like, yeah, Lina, of course. Uh, but she just like, she just like get, got me this like hunger, mm. you know, for for this and uh, to this day, you know, Erica and I speak, I mean, almost weekly. So for example, uh, I don't know, I did this competition in Paris and I was struggling finding like, uh, uh, like a, a meaning to a formata, even if, you know, like intellectually and I just like call Charles and I'm like, and I'm like Charles, how do I do this formata? Yeah. You know, even like when I'm already out, you know, almost 10 years. Yes. They it, are always for me, with me. They're there for me all the time. It sounds like you were lucky in meeting two teachers at the beginning who both of them, in different ways, in their own way, were saying to you, you've got to be you. You've got to, you know, be yourself. And by being yourself, you will work your way through it. You know, I think every conductor who makes a career of conducting works out at some point that they have to be themselves there will be enough people out there on the planet who will understand them like them want to work with them there will be others who don't you know we all meet those but but but, yeah but the the point is is that right from the beginning you sounds like you had two people who really started you off on the right track I mean I was going to say you know know, adding on sorry Lee go on sorry no um I want to say that because I started so early in Colombia in my mm. the, the the very first encounter with a pedagogy in conducting was a, I don't want to say very traumatizing but yes well, <laughs> you know because yeah. it was always met with so much resistance or so yes. much it wasn't even doubt there was no doubt that I was going to fail all, all right. the time you know so that was like the mindset that I that I was ingrained for so long. And uh, when I graduated, I was like, I need, to, I, I think that, that I own it to, to my family mm. and myself, you know, my upbringing, as I told you with my parents who always were so supportive um, to see like, oh, I need to leave. And when I left, um, when I left that, that environment, uh, I was very picky. I'm very specific about finding main mentors that gave me opportunities like that. Yeah, so yeah. for me, it was like when I started auditioning in the States, I always I only auditioned in the States. I was only interested in, I don't know why, but that's how I felt. Um, I started meeting teachers and meeting people. And, you know, for me, it, it, took, it took a while for me to get the right teacher, you mm. know, to... Uh, like some of them, I, I just didn't get accepted to the master's degrees in some of orchestral conducting programs. So, but some of them, I just, when I saw them, I, I really ran away. <laughs> it, was, it was, it was uh, I mean, I understood that it was not only me audition, uh, auditioning for them, but I should have, like I needed to bet on my own future because yes. I needed to, to have someone who believed in me. Mm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that was that, that was one of the best decisions that I ever made, even if it took me a while to mm. just start on the right foot. Mm. 
going ahead, uh, and often other people have have had this situation because you know you go you go to master classes, you go to um, courses, you go to competitions, and you have, get mentorship. You know, you've been mentored by some pretty incredible names. I'm just going to list Marin Olsop, Bernard Heitink, Bramwell Tovey, Yannick Nezi Sagan. Um, and currently, you have, after winning the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, Sir George Schulte International Conducting Competition, my God, that's a tongue twister, uh, you now have an association with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra and being mentored by Ricardo Muti. How do you process, I mean, you know, five great names there, Allsop, Heiting, Toby, Nezi Sagan and Ricardo Muti. How do you process the advice that you're given from them and add it to what you learned, you know, at the, at the foundation you know, of your studies with, with Charles Peltz and Erica. Um, you know, how do you, how do you add the extra layers to the cake? You know, and decide which which bits are good and which bits maybe don't suit you. With a little bit of care, yes. you know, yeah, yeah. But it's with a lot of patience and care, and just observing where their motivations are. Mm. They give me advice. Uh, with all the names that you gave me, I mean, both, all of them have been extremely selfless. Yes. Uh, in, and there is, n there is no doubt that they're, it's not about their careers that they're mentoring me. No. For. no, 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 no. So, exactly. <laughs> I mean, why? Yeah. Um, so, everything that they have given me, it's, um, it's just a gift. Yeah. And then for me, it's like, I don't know, having a library and one day I take something out of one and then one day take something out of the other and that's it. In, um, I, I keep very good notes, yeah. you know, yeah. on what I've learned from, from then. I, uh, some of them I have videos. Some it's just like the notes in my scores. Yeah. But every time I open a score that I've studied with them, I know that I can use this and this and this and that. So, yeah. yes, yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky. Uh, all of I, them have great. I love that answer about the fact that you've got a library of information from, you know, these five names, seven names, if you count Charles and Erica as well. And when needed, you take that book off the shelf and use it. But I yeah. think the, the other thing about it is that Sometimes th that book won't come off the shelf for 10, 15, 20 years. And some of the things they're going to tell you when you're young, you don't realise that how important they are until much later. And you think, oh, God, my God, actually, what I was told that 15 years ago, and now I'm using it. Now I'm learning it. You know, you, there are things that they said to you that you haven't used yet. You know, that's the point, isn't it? Yes, and some things that I don't understand. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yet, you know, and... It, that this is this is one of the greatest gifts as conductors that you never stop learning. Yeah. So sometimes I see notes that I was like, oh my god, yes, as you said, um, someone already told me this that I am discovering for myself. That yeah. <laughs> I'm discovering, you know, boiled water, but also some things that I just learn, you know, uh, as I told you, I keep like even if they say the the most random thing, I put it on my score when they say it, you know, yeah. I'm just like, like uh, actively absorbing everything. And sometimes it's like, oh, now I'm ready to absorb this bit of knowledge that I didn't yeah. know that was going to be. So yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's a treasure. The other way that we learn, of course, and you've been, you've been and still are, in a wonderful situation that most conductors would kill for. You know, you have your relationship at the moment with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. You're also conducting fellow at the Philadelphia Orchestra, having had the same job at the Seattle Symphony Orchestra. Three great orchestras of the US, of the world. You know, what differences, if there are any at all, between the three of you sort of learnt by conducting, but also just by sitting and chatting in the canteen over a cup of coffee with some players, you know, they're, they're also the great resources, aren't they? The players of the orchestra. Are there any differences between those three orchestras or, or, or would you say that they're very similar? No, they're very different in their music making. Mm. Uh, very, very different. I want to say that the, the biggest difference is repertoire approach. Right. Repertoire approach. And uh, with that, uh, you know, the sound profile is already completely different. Um, I wouldn't say which one is better or worse. They're just they're just diverse, and yeah. 
what I've learned from them is that uh, in general, they just want conductors who can inspire them. Yes. And they can understand what their sound is mm. from the first downbeat, all of them, yeah. you know? So it's not, so if you understand how they process their sound, then you can work with them because yeah. they can know what to do. And it's not going to be about you discovering yourself in mm. the in the thing. So that's why I, I think I uh, I keep good relationships with 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 all of them. I mean, I still have good, uh, great, warm relationship with the Seattle Symphony musicians, even if I haven't seen them this season because they're just amazing. Mm. And some of them were in the Philadelphia Orchestra, you know? So at the end, it, it's a small world and everybody knows each other and their sound and their sound experiences permeate, you yeah. know, they cross over at some point. Mm. And in Chicago, I mean, Chicago has been a very interesting experience because I have yet to conduct them. I have conducted the other ensembles, but I just sit there mm. and experience their music and boy, that is some orchestra yeah, uh, yeah. you know they can play whatever the hell they want <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes I'm know, sure. yes and the other thing is that a uh, good orchestras have no i mean no insecurities inside yeah. it you know there's there is little animosity towards conductors at those levels mm. uh, just because they're just sure of what they are yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely fair. I think, you know, the orchestras, the great orchestras that I've conducted, yeah, they know what they are, they know what they're about, and, and they want you to inspire them. Um, you just mentioned the first downbeat, you know, putting the downbeat down and, and assimilating the sound that comes back at you. It's something every time we go and conduct a new orchestra, as a guest conductor, we have to do instantly. You know, I've, I, we're friends on Facebook. I know you've just returned from a very long trip in Europe, 30 odd days, including a couple of, you know, lost baggages and all that sort of stuff. And you're now finally back home again. But um, I wonder whether you have any strategies or tactics about how, you know, how to approach a new orchestra. When you walk in on Monday morning, somebody says, well, please welcome our conductor this week, Lena Gonzalez Granados, and everybody's looking at you. And, and how, you know, how <laughs> exactly uh, your face tells me. Yeah, yeah, I've got that feeling every time I stand in front of an orchestra like that as well. But yeah, how, how have you got any strategies or, or, or any do's and don'ts for any young conductors um, who are listening, of which I know there are many? Well, you know, um, I, I want to say that the very first thing is to let them play. Mm. Like at least the, first, the, the first piece that you put on the table, it's like a, a letter of presentation. Like yeah. that's your kilom vitae. Yeah. So that you don't, that you let them know you first. Yes. You know, 90% uh, of the time they will have preconceived notions. Yes. And from the first down bit, and sometimes you are going to be at lost. Mm. And uh, even with that feeling, you you know that uh, you should always focus on that at the end of the process, at the last rehearsal or the last concert, that you did your best, even if you were at last. You mm. know, so you get and you were so just you were just yourself. You know, that's yeah, the, yeah, that you were yeah, just yourself. Yeah. Sometimes yourself is enough. Sometimes yes. it's not, and sometimes your enough is not something that they're used to. No. Uh, you know, you just have to accept that. Sometimes, yeah. you know, I just came back from one experience that, uh, you know, I see, I see people how they go with Chicago, with, uh, I don't know, with uh, Philadelphia, and always it's very polite. Mm. Uh, um, and not only it's polite, it's a, an active conversation, but some orchestras don't like mm. a, a conversation in rehearsal. Meaning like, do you have any questions? Do you, like, they think that that is a part of a weakness and then they take over. They want to really, yes. you know, they really want to take over. And if you, you know, I learned this way, I learned this past uh, tour that, you know, that my I might need to have 
to develop something more than myself and just like be a little more attuned cu culturally. Mm -hmm. to, yeah. You know, uh, so it's, I, I'm a learning process. I, mm. I, I, I'm a, yeah, so. <laughs> We're all a learning I, process, I, Lena. <laughs> I, I, yes, I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah. Uh, but what I know is that even with a bad experience or a weird experience, I always come back stronger because mm. at the end of the day, I'm the one standing in the podium and the concert has to happen. So I have to make it happen. Yeah. So, but I, I think that's also, I think there's a whole generation of conductors now. I, I may be speaking in general terms here, but I think there's a whole generation of which I am definitely one, even though I'm older, but you know, who who want to collaborate, who at the end of playing a piece say, has anybody got any questions? Anybody want to re repeat anything? You know, they don't want to just shut the score and say, right, on we go and ignore the feelings of the players. Exactly. And I think, I think most orchestras uh, are in agreement with this and actually find it a rather refreshing and nice thing to do. I still think exactly. there are some orchestras in some cultures who hate, hate, it. Yeah, who, who hate it, who think it's a sign of weakness that you haven't got your approach and whatever else. But actually, the way I look at it is, if you want to play another piece again to make you feel happier for tomorrow's rehearsal or for the concert later on, I'd be stupid not to ask you, and I'd be stupid not to let you do the thing you want to rehearse. But as you said, some orchestras, you know, will, will, will until some of those older generation of players retire and younger ones come through, you know, it, it's like anything. The orchestras are also evolving as well as we're evolving, and that's the point, you know. You know, I found it uh, interesting that you mentioned that because uh, with this particular experience that I am telling you, it was the John Luther ones. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm surprised about that. But... Yeah, exactly. I was like, yeah. okay, I just feel sad about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I feel sad for you because things are being done in bigger orchestras that are done differently. You'll yeah. never get, get a chance to stand up for a better job. Yeah, Oops, yeah. And say it, you know? Mm. You know, it's time to change. Yeah. It's to make these, you know, like her, her, hierarchical, hierarchical, how do you say it? Hierarchical oh. systems yes. have been changing. I mean, on the longest time, you see it in, uh, I don't know, enterprises. You see it in big, big names of, of places, CEOs yes. and everything. And we still want to keep, a, you know, a crumbling system. That uh, I mean, the pandemic showed it. We we need to be. We need to, either we change it or we cancel concerts. At this point, I asked Lena about Unitas, a chamber-sized ensemble that concentrates on Latin American music and culture that she founded. She says as both a protest and as a gift to the city of Boston. If you want to hear that short discussion, I've turned it into a Patreon-exclusive bonus mini episode. For as little as £5 a month, you can get access to this mini-episode, as well as all of the previous 16 mini-episodes. You'll also get a monthly bulletin podcast from me about my career, as well as advanced news about this podcast. You'll also get an interview once a month with a prominent person from the classical music world who has dealings with conductors, as well as articles, essays, and all sorts of other conducting-based content. The details of how to join are in the show notes below, and I'd love to see you subscribe to the Supporters Club of A Mic on the Podium very soon. Now, back to my chat with my guest, Lina Gonzalez Granados. As a young conductor who's guesting a lot, as we've talked about, but also somebody who, through Unitas, was learning a lot of new music, how do you learn a score? What's your process? Have you got a process? Do you start from big to small? Uh, do you sit and use your piano skills? And more importantly, for the conducting students and geeks like me, are you a scribbler? Do you write lots of things in your scores? Well, you've told me you write lots of quotes from your mentors, but do you write a lot of musical notes to yourself? Or do you try and keep it as clean as possible? And are you a user of colours? Are you red, blue, black, highlighter oh. pens and all of that? <laughs> How do you do it? Ah, uh, you're showing me a whole pot of pencils. Well, there we are. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a good, yeah. that's a, a simple answer. No, I, um, it depends on the score. Yes. Definitely. Um, the score, some of the scores need more information visually yeah. than others. Um, just because uh, when you are in the podium, you just need, you know, 
this cue to get you into the moment with them. Mm. Uh, so, for example, with a score that, that has a lot of information already, I just keep a lot of colors that are already like into my system. Yeah. I, um, you know, like I have used the same colors for a while now that I have, mm. and I am always um, experimenting mm. with the with the with my tools, with my writing tools. But for example, a, a very very um, uh, the things that I write, for example, if it's if it's um, a very complex rhythm, mm. you know, not not mixed meter, but complex rhythm inside the line that I don't, I can't figure it out. Like uh, as if I sight read it, if there is something that I can't sight read, I write on top of it. Mm. And I, I write what I, you know, like how, how it made sense in my life, like how I, I started, you know, either the composite rhythm or which cue I need to be thinking where to put the downbeat, you know, like arrows and everything. So for me to understand how this is. Yeah. So that that is the kind of information I have in a very complex new music score. Mm. Uh, I don't write like I don't scribble thoughts on the score per se, but I have a lot of post its. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I put a lot of post its, and uh, all of them also depends on the color. Uh, and it depends on the size as well. Right. So, for example, I have the, the little size for just the small thought, or if I need a more explanation that is not mine, I use a longer one. You know, uh, I'm very, yes. And uh, in general, I have a lot of colors. And I, I, lately, I used to um, uh, use highlighters a mm. lot um, just to keep uh, layers. The, yes. If there were layers that in, were in common, you know, but um, as then when I got older, I teach the highlighters because sometimes with the lighting, they don't pop up and yeah. then actually uh, disrupt you from yeah. the from, from actually seeing. And also because I'm getting older, you know, <laughs> so the, the more that I put, then I have to do this. But uh, I discovered like uh, removable highlighters. Mm -hmm. So I also don't have to commit to a marking. Yes. Uh, that, is the, that is the most important, that every marking that I do is never absolute. Okay, so, so you can always remove it, yeah. Exactly, that I can always, like everything that is erasable, like I spend all my money into erasable highlighters, pens, erasable everything. Yeah. Um, because some of the scores that I have that are quite expensive, I just like made bad decisions on it. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. to, you know, I, I will have to buy it again. Mm. So th those are the ones. And then, yes, I use, for example, um, if I do mix meter, I use di different, for example, if it's like um, six, eight, five, eight, seven, eight, I use one color and then three, four, you know, if it's in the same, I just use different colors. Okay. Yeah. And and, uh, and it, it, it's I, I suspect you're you're like me in the fact that it by writing the information in whether you you know I use three colors whether you use eight or ten or whatever but by writing it in you you learn the score that way um, yeah. you know I, I remember you know coming to the end of a page and thinking I know what's written on the next page because I remember writing it I know it's in that color and whatever and it. Absolutely. It, it means that in the concert that you you know you've got a friend down there they're looking up at you with all of the information that you wrote in and yeah. it, it actually gets my head up out of the score more but then some conductors have said to me if i write a, lo a load of stuff in i'd just be staring at it and i wouldn't be looking at the score so we all have our own way but you know it yeah. sounds yeah it sounds like we're similar on it manually, yeah. I yeah 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 i'm the same thing you know that that's and as you said like how do you study a score uh, I try to go to a piano and, you know, especially classical, like more, more canonical ones, I, I enjoy play it more. But when it's not, if it's new music, uh, the way that I use the piano is very differently. You know, yeah. it's, it's, uh, the things that I can't uh, solfege, I'm, yes. I'm very good at, actually at solfege and that is like my biggest pride, like a real time solfege with, you know, very fast things. Uh, if I can't solfege it, I go to a piano. Yeah. Or if I can't hear it, I go to a piano and work on it individually. And sometimes in the hotel, I can't, you know, 
no. I just go like, you know, there. So I, I have my keyboard and just like use it just to memorize the pitch and know mm. that those are the pitches that I need. Lena, it's that time of the podcast where we must traverse the 10 questions. And as ever, I start with what sound or noise do you love and what sound or noise do you hate? The noise that I hate the most, there are two noises that I absolutely hate. One is like, um, you know, blackboard? Yes. And like a uh, chuck. Mm, yeah. Chuck touches it and it sounds like that look i have gun swaps only <laughs> thinking about it yeah. that is one. and the other is when someone is like cutting meat or anything and they touch the plate and it sounds like the squeak yeah. you know that that they just or they don't know how to cut food it really like messes with me it's the same and i think it has similarities with the shock you mm. know both of them are like almost the same and the noise i love is my dad's or my mom's laugh <laughs> brilliant that's the first time i've ever heard that answer in over a hundred episodes that's wonderful really good answer it makes me so happy to hear my dad's laugh you know mm, brilliant if you had 24 hours free what would you spend it doing i would spend doing it by eating going to places and restaurants and just eat very weird food that i've never tasted that is like my favorite thing Oh, well, I'm looking forward to the answer to question 10 now. <laughs> uh, I mean, I always look forward to the answer to question 10 anyway, but now I really am looking forward to it. Question four, however, uh, this is a nice one. I always like this one because great names get talked about. Who would be a favourite conductor or conductors of yesteryear? George Petren is mm. one. Uh, I want uh, Raphael Kubelik. Mm. And... Um, what uh, who else there's so many you know bruno walter mm. and Schulte. oh my god oh like i love Schulte. Mm. yes actually four names especially Schulte and pretra george pretra i mean he's he's conducting so characterful i love watching him videos of him conduct and there's i think there's one of him rehearsing as well something i think it might be la Primitive and fond um but yeah, yeah. four four yes. names that don't come out very often at all um yeah, and, and I had I, I there was one that I love, 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 and I cannot remember his name. Maybe you can uh, remind me. It's this guy, Czech, who died very, very early on an airplane. Istak Kerstek. Oh, Kurtesh. Kurtesh. It's the Oh my God, I've been yes. trying to find his yeah. name because he's the Vorjak. I mean. Oh, I think they're amazing. Yeah. I mean, there is nothing like Kuelik and his is like, mm. you know, those are, yeah, my favorite. Yeah, the Kurtish recordings of Vorjak are amazing. Okay. I only discovered them recently, and yeah, they are absolutely amazing. Yeah. Well, question five. Uh, let's see if uh, your, your answers are as interesting as your question four. Can you name a favorite current conductor or conductors? Conductors, yeah, too many, huh? <laughs> um, I like. Definitely Yannick. Um, I love Maestro Muti just because working with them, uh, I can see where they go and I understand, you know, yeah. the recordings better. I like Semyon Bishkov mm -hmm. a lot, a lot. Um, and I like Mirga. Mirga, yes. The, recordings of uh, every recording that I've seen with her is just so illuminating so mm. yes, those are my my four currents and I hey, what's the name of this guy uh, I know him I know him I know him uh, <laughs> another guessing game <laughs> the, 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 the guy from Music Eterna uh, oh um Teodor Carensis yes mm. yes be just because he's so different, not necessarily, you know, some of the things uh, I'm just like, wow, someone there to do that, that I always wanted to do, you mm. know? So, 
uh, whatever, I, if I agree or not with everything, uh, I just like like that he takes those like very extreme chances. Yes. A little calculated sometimes, but. Yeah. Well, again, a very interesting list of names. Um, I think I've asked all of them um, and um, to varying degrees of success to come on the podcast. But oh, again, all very interesting. Um, and yeah, brilliant choices. Wonderful. Thank you. What is the hardest work you have ever conducted? There is this piece called a Walkabout Concerto for Orchestra by a... Uh, uh, American composer Gabriela Lina Frank. Mm. The last movement of it, the mix meter, makes any it makes the right of spring look like a Mozart symphony. <laughs> it, and you know, it's like one of these pieces that a uh, you know it, it, it's a workout. Mm. It's an mental workout, and it's just for me, it's like the most satisfying to get into that piece and just, you know, transcend with it. And emotionally so many, I would say, oh, Mahler, any yeah. Mahler, Mahler to uh, the last movement always get in, in a different piece. And the one that I'm looking forward to conduct that I know it's going to be the hardest work, uh, but it's my favorite piece of all time. So it's also Sprague. Ah. That is a piece that I want to, like, every time I'm just like, can someone hire me to conduct also Sprague? Because I'm ready to just tackle that. It's just the most amazing piece. Well, I was lucky enough when the CBSA Youth Orchestra performed it, I think off the top of my head, it was with Jack Van Steen that I did get to rehearse Elsa Sprague Zarathustra. Um, and it was one of those where you just think, well, I, you know, dear Jack, I love Jack. But yeah, I hope I hope on your travel over to Birmingham, you fall over and break your arm and I can conduct the concert. <laughs> he didn't, and I didn't really mean it, but you know what I mean? It was one of those, uh, I have to do this quite regularly with the CBSA Youth Orchestra and love doing it, where I rehearse the thing through till Thursday and then the conductor who does a concert does Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I've learned so much repertoire that way and I love doing that job. But there have been occasions where I've thought, uh, I really want to do this concert, I, you know, I, um, and that was one of them. Uh, I've yet to conduct it either and I would love to. Just, I mean, just that opening string chorale after the, you know, the famous very opening, just that alone, you just, oh, this is just divine. Yeah, wonderful, yeah. wonderful choice. Thank you. Next one. When traveling abroad to conduct, what item could you not leave home without? Well, the one that I have never left with uh, without is um, um, it's a batch of Colombian coffee. Ah. I always bring it's a dried coffee, but I always bring my own coffee to to tour because it makes me feel like home uh, all the time, and I don't have to suffer with like bad coffee everywhere. <laughs> Mm. And, you know, so even if I have good coffee, for example, in Italy, that they sell good coffee, then it's a gift. Mm. And uh, like any, you know, but I hate having to drink bad coffee just because that's the only thing. And when I have it, I get very grouchy. <laughs> that is like the one. And the last one, um, I I call it like an emotional support pillow. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a, this little pillow. It's not, it's like a... Uh, a travel pillow and kind of, that it, um, it's in form of a Shiva Inu because I have a dog, as you can see, a Shiva Inu. Mm. It reminds me of home. I call him a uh, Softakovich. <laughs> so my emotional... I, I can't even say that. Softakovich. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> yeah, like Softakovich and my coffee are the two things I don't leave. What is the one thing you would change about being a conductor? I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't change anything about being a conductor. The only thing that I would change is a, you know, a very selfish musicians that think that conductors are their enemies. Mm -hmm. a, but that, that doesn't have anything to do about a, being a conductor because conducting is such a beautiful art. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you devote your life and sacrifice so much for. So I would change the musicians around sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you don't want to go, if, if you don't want to go play, just retire and do something else. Mm. You know, a lot of works that you can go, but you don't have to just bring ugliness into the business. 
Well, my last bad experience with an orchestra was exactly one of those. And I felt like saying to this particular gentleman, I will narrow it down. Uh, for, I won't just say person, I will say gentleman. Uh, firstly, that he wasn't a gentleman. And secondly, that if you think you can do any better, please take up conducting and find out, you know, exactly what it's like to be stood there and attacked by somebody for apparently no reason whatsoever. Um, yeah, it, it, you know, in the end, the job that they're doing, you've just said it, that involves conductors. If you're in a symphony orchestra, you're going to be conducted every week of your life. So, you know, get used to it. If you don't like it, leave. Go and be a chamber musician. Go and be a solo, whatever, you know. Um, and I absolutely agree with you. Uh, and as I said earlier, I think there's a generation of conductors, you know, the dictator authority, authoritarian conductor doesn't exist really anymore. We want to collaborate. We want to make music with you. Um, you know, don't be so aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wonder, it's talking about suggesting to players that they might want to leave and go and do something else. Let's find out what profession other than your own you might like to attempt. Uh, in real life or fantasy, I would have loved, uh, I mean, equally as a music, I would have loved to be a doctor. Mm. And I would love, I would have loved to be a psychiatrist so yeah. I can treat those musicians and make them retire. <laughs> but no, I mean, I I, I've said it before, you know, part of our job is to be, is to, is to know about the psychology of orchestras and, and you, know, you almost are a psychiatrist or either your own head or their heads, you know, the musicians' heads. Um, but yeah. No, but Joking, joking aside, I mean, I'm fascinated by psychology. I'm fascinated by psychiatry, and I'm an avid reader on things that of psychiatry documents and you know uh, journals. Yeah. Every month, I go, you know, and when I don't un don't understand things uh, in the New England Journal and everything, I call my dad and I was like, Dad, what does this mean? I love, love, love learning uh, about medicine. Mm. yeah it's a day well, because sometimes i educate my parents even their they're doctors and they're like stop i've <laughs> <laughs> been right mm. this is like the crazy stuff sometimes they call me like hey have you like come up with an article about this and that and i'm like i got it for you it's like the thing that i love yeah you know? yeah Oh, so the apple doesn't fall that far from the tree then, as the phrase goes, you know, with yeah. growing up with two doctors that, you know, if you hadn't have taken the full fan music that you would have been yeah. very happy following in their footsteps. What I mean. Yeah. What I, mean. I did say earlier on, I was looking forward to question 10. I always do, but you did mention weird and wonderful cuisines. So let's find out. If the world were to end tonight, what would be your choice of final meal and drink? Well, um, in September, I went to this restaurant called El Cielo, which is heaven in mm. Spanish. I've heard of it, yeah. El Cielo is the first Michelin starred restaurant uh, of Colombian cuisine. Mm. And they had, it's called the Bread of Life, uh, which is the most amazing yuca a bread I've ever eaten in my life, which is like, it was like a toast that it's in form of a, I mean, I've never eaten the way that I ate that day. I I want, if I could, I could go every day. I would go there. <laughs> and then, you know, it's like 16 courses of heaven. Uh, so if it, it, if it ends, I want to be in heaven already, you know? <laughs> Well, I'll make sure when I do the, the the social media release that I tag in if they've got a social media account, El Cielo, and, it's um, and they, they know that um, that their sixteen course meal has been recommended. Uh, it sounds awesome. I mean, they, that 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 sounds a great way to go. I need to show you a picture of it because it's. Uh, I mean, it it's crazy. It's really it, it really is. Let me show it. Um, but you're cutting there, right? Uh, I can you. cut, but also. Uh, whilst you're trying to find the picture, I'm intrigued to know, did you do what I would do when you go to these places and have the wine that they suggest that you have with the 16 courses? Did you do that? They, no, they, I, I actually didn't drink uh, anything that I ordered, but they give you like different cocktails. Yes. So there was this, co this cocktail uh, with vodka and mandarin. Oh. Yeah like like colombian mandarins that are very very sweet and juicy but small like yeah, yeah. 
and that thing was out of this world. I mean, <laughs> there was nothing in that meal that was, you know, they had, um, how do you call it, uh, crabs, crab yeah. buñuelos, which is, a, bu a buñuelo is like a cheese uh, slash, um, I don't know, uh, like a bread. Yeah. No, I mean, and then they had this um, seafood, like molecular uh, seafood uh, thing, so that it looked like foam, and then when you taste it, it just tastes like home. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was nothing. There was just like one plate that I was like, uh, maybe this is not like anything like I've eaten, but I yeah. dig it. Still. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I can tell you now that you've made me very hungry. Um, <laughs> Uh, which is always a good it's a, always a good sign and what a good way to spend an hour or so lena i've thoroughly enjoyed chatting to you and i hope in the very near future maybe when on your one on your trips to europe another one of your trips to europe that we get to meet and we can um maybe not share 12 courses but you know maybe three uh, and, a, and a, a cocktail or two i would love that very much thank you so much michael for finding the time to look for me and to get to know me and just just share thoughts about our profession which is it's so commendable that you do thank you so much a mic on the podium was devised and produced by michael seal with music by ben dawson Next time, I chat with a French conductor who shot to fame after winning the Donatella Flick competition in the year 2000. Since then, he's held title positions in Belgium, Germany and the United Kingdom, as well as starting his own period instrument ensemble, Les Siècles, in 2003. But until then, bye-bye. <laughs>